dial him in and bring him up to speed when he comes in. Um, hello everyone, if you are here, it's to listen to horror and tabletop RPGs. Before we get started and before I introduce myself and my fellow panelists, I would like to know in the audience who is here to learn about horror and RP TTRPGs because you are a DM and you want to scare your players. Awesome. Wow, okay. And how many of you are here because you want to design horror games that DMs can use? Okay, so it's more on the... Oh, there you go. Oh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right, My right. people. <laughs> how many your of you people? thought My this people. was a different panel and you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> you're, just the the next yeah. you're just afraid to leave now because it's due to horror. <laughs> how many of you are not sure what day it is? Uh, there we go. All right, awesome. My people. Um, <laughs> So um, I would like to, uh, so we're going to run this panel a little bit differently because we do have a lot of panelists and, and believe me, the knowledge in this room is enough to fill like an entire Gen Con. It's like ridiculous. Uh, I am so proud and so pleased to introduce um, my fellow panelists today and we'll, how we're going to introduce ourselves. We're going to keep our introductions really short. Uh, just tell us where to find you. But the first question that I have for you is for a mood or a genre. I ask all oh, I'm first. Questions, so I'm going to oh, start oh, with you. Oh, okay, great. I'm here. Uh, my name is Alan Patrick. I uh, I can I guess be found on the Shattered Remnants of Twitter. Uh, don't really do much else currently because I'm trying to see how the pieces fall. Uh, horror is a mood. It very what much is because there's so many. You want to be uh, I'm Keith Baker. I am best known for creating the Camp Henson of Eberron. I am online as Hellcal Keith on most social media, KeithBaker.com or TogetherStudios.com. Um, Horror-wise, I will particularly call out a Phoenix Dawn Command, which is sort of fantasy survival horror uh, game. And I agree with you on mood. To me, part of the point is horror can be imbued into any genre. And so you can have horror as its own standalone genre, but horror is something you can have anyway. I'm Crystal Mazer. I am a freelance uh, writer and game developer. Um, on social media, you can find me on all social media platforms at Body and Soul 152. My website is thegeekypanda.com, and you can also find me on Darker Days Radio Podcast, which is where the recording is going to go if you're interested in that. Um, as far as like with uh, being a uh, um, genre or uh, mood, I, I'm i going to say both, but I lean more towards the genre part mm. because it there's a lot that encompasses mood, including themes that may or may not be touched upon in other different genres. And so I lean more towards like the genre part. Awesome. So let me just, be Shane, before you go, let me just catch up. Uh, this is, this is Andrew Gaska. Uh, let me just catch you up really quick. So the first question that we're going to ask is, is for a mood or a genre? Uh, and with this number of panelists, we're, I'm just going to politely remind everybody, we all don't have to answer the same question twice. Except this time. Uh, except this, except one. this one. I think you um, shouldn't have told him what the question was. <laughs> <laughs> I was sitting there trying to figure out what it was. So. Okay, and, then, and then I did want to let you know our, our, our audience was very lovely and revealing what they were here for. There are a lot of DMs in the audience who want to learn how to scare their players and some of them want to learn how to design horror scenarios. Mm. Um, so Shane, if you would like to... I'm Shane Hensley. I make Deadlands, Savage Worlds. I've done a lot of video games, novels, miniatures games, card games, all kinds of crazy stuff. Been doing this for a long time. Uh, I think it is... Uh, that's a great question. I think it is a genre. It, you know, it's listed in the genre list of genres. But I think mood is its a great way to think about it because every genre I run tends to have some horror in it. Uh, Disney movies have horror in them, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, The Hunchback of Notre Dame is one of the scariest scenes in, in all of Disney's movies, if, if you remember the, the big fire scene and stuff. So there's great elements of that, and that's a very cool way to look at it. Uh, I'm Andrew E.C. Gasker. I'm the writer of the Alien role-playing game, uh, the Terminator role-playing game, a couple of choose your own adventure graphic novels, uh, Planet Apes novels, things like that. Um, I, it's funny because I, since, since childhood, I always was like, oh, horror. You know, ooh, I'm scared. It didn't. I didn't. wasn't wasn't into it. But yet, Alien was different to me for some reason. I didn't think that as horror. I thought it was sci-fi with a horror mood. So I'm gonna go with mood. Okay. Yeah. That's really good to know. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm your friendly neighborhood moderator, Monica Valencinelli. What we'll do at 15 minutes two, we're gonna we're gonna have a hard cut at five two to clear out the room and let the other panel come in. Um, I will I will open it up to questions. So please, if you have questions for our panelists, just remember. 
what it is that they said and remind us and stand up when you ask your question, but we'll get to that point in a little bit. Um, so, so, so jumping off that point, I think one of the most important questions from a DM's perspective is how do you, how do you establish the mood in a way that makes the players care without making it seem like they should expect a jump scare or something like that? Like, how do you establish the mood? Anybody want to roll with that? Crystal, you're smiling. I am. Um, um, I, so in order to be able to like push the mood and everything like that, you have to figure out where hard stops are. Um, I, in, in anything. What's a hard stop? A hard stop is where um, players do not want to finish that scene. It's either traumatic for them or it could bring up some other things where they now aren't able to sleep at night and having nightmares or something like that. Um, the goal is to scare your players, not traumatize them. Um, and so you have to figure out like where those boundaries can be. Um, and in games where you are familiar with the people, you might already know like, hey, I can't really push that. But if you're at like a convention, you kind of have to have some sort of feel as far as how far you can push that in order for them to be comfortable with setting a mood um, for your players to be comfortable with getting into that sort of play. So, so let, me, let me just paraphrase what you're saying so I understand. So what you're saying is the most important thing is to understand what, where the sides of the box are mm -hmm. uh, for, because horror is a broad range of, you know, bloody and, or not horror, yep. or, you know, like, uh, what's the other word, like, uh, more c cerebral yes. horror, right? So you want to know where the sides of the box are so that they feel comfortable exploring. It. Yes, and they feel better to push their boundaries. Anybody want to agree or yeah. disagree with that? I, I completely agree with that. I think that part of the experience of a tabletop role-playing game is that it is a collaborative story. Mm -hmm. And part of the thing about horror is I don't know what is frightening to you, let alone the issue of what is too frightening to you. You know that to have the best experience with a horror game, you need buy-in from the players and you need them to want to be scared. And so certainly one of the things we did in Phoenix is draw on the players to add elements to a scene mm -hmm. or to things. You know, I'm going to say there's a scene uh, in your game I run where you're in a cursed forest. You get to the grove that should have the statue of the forest guardian. And I say, oh, but there's something wrong. There's, you know, corpses of animals all around it and its lips are sewn shut. But there's one other thing that really bothers you about it. What is it? And the point is, I want you to tell me what is going to scare you here. And the point is, you know, like one player says, oh, it doesn't have any eyes. Its eyes have been gouged out and people are like, ooh. Another player would be like, either, bleh, or, oh, that's, you know, I don't want to deal with, like, people losing their eyes. You know, the point is, now, by asking questions like that, whether straight up in a sort of session zero for a long-term campaign, or just, like, literally in the scene, tell me something scary about this, I am learning what they want to be scared by. Mm -hmm. Like, what, I like, oh, now I'm going to work that eye thing in. Uh, because that's something that you, you know, both find scary, but you have volunteered to mm -hmm. find scary, as opposed to, you know, then having that opposite yep. issue of the things you know they don't want to yeah. have invoked. Mm -hmm. Shane, with Savage Worlds, Savage Worlds has a lot of, like, active participation and a lot of active rules. It's very action-centric. For, for a game like that, where the mood is so integral to the story and the game that you're playing. How does horror play out with, with, with that? Uh, okay, so first off, you know, we have a lot of different settings, everything from East Texas University, which is kind of like Buffy in college, to, to Deadlands. Uh, and a lot of times, um, it, is, it can be very pulpy if you play you know, full combat roles, tactical, all that kind of stuff, but it can also be very horrific and suspenseful, and the monsters just can't be beat until you figure out what the mystery is, right? You just have to run from it. There's a Deadlands adventure I run a lot, used to, called uh, Dead Men Walking. Um, <clears throat> they're camping in the Kansas prairie, prairie grass, and they hear the, the prairie grass rustle. And under the table, I have a piece of paper, and I rustle it like that. This thing jumps out at them. It attacks them. They can't defeat it. They have no idea what to do. I actually kill them all in the first scene because they come back as, as Harrow, which is a, a Deadlands thing. But what's really cool is throughout the rest of the adventure, anytime this thing is getting close, I just rustle the paper 
and just oh, take it. Oh, that's a great set. <laughs> yeah, and it scares them. Everybody taking notes on that one? Right now? Yeah. That's a great set. And, uh, you know, just at home, you know, don't underestimate the, the basic stuff. You know, some background music, dim the lights if you want to run, you know, creepy stuff. It's, it's hard to do horror for me and get that kind of feel at a con, for example, in a room with 40 voices. You got to shout over and that kind of bright lights and stuff. You, you can do it, but it's tougher. So one of the things that I'm picking up from you, Shane, is that, that space really, uh, the space or where people are located really does help. Um, Andrew, you worked on Aliens. Of course, the ship is, it is both its own character and it's mm -hmm. the, the environment where people are playing. How do you use the ship to terrify players? Um, just, just remove the alien out of it completely. Like, how does the ship play into that fear? I mean... I mean, the ship is a labyrinth, so it's terrifying anyway. You feel like you're gonna get lost at any moment, you know? So they, basically what you do is you play with lighting. Um, it, if, if I was running this uh, a game in my basement, I would be controlling the lights, have them flicker every now and then, you know? It, you, you, it's, it's all about sounds and, and visuals and anything that you can take in, like he was saying, without actually spelling it out because uh, you're, you're training them to, to react a certain way with the crinkling of the paper. So um, having, having uh, steam go off uh, from, a, from a pipe or something like that, oh, oh, there's all these things that you see in all the alien movies that you could totally use like that to scare people. Um, <clears throat> one of the things I was going to say about this though was what I try to do with set it up is I try to give, to scare everybody, I give them the setup that they think they know. Like the Chariot of the Gods, it starts on a ship like the Nostromo, and you find a derelict ship. So you think, okay, I saw this movie, you know. But when the thing comes out of the shadows, it's not what you thought it was, and it's like, wait, what is it doing? What is going on? And everything falls apart for the party, and you see these confident people who are walking in there, scrambling back to the airlock. Um, so it's it, it's it's playing with expectations, I guess. Is what um, so speaking of playing with expectations, um, so uh, my understanding is that you deal a lot with cosmic horror, with yes. the Cthulhu mythos and whatnot. And cosmic horror is very interesting, especially in a horror setting, because um, fatalism completely goes against my worldview, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm sure it goes against a lot of people's worldview that you mm -hmm. don't have an option. So, so what is it like trying to both establish the mood when people have those preconceived expectations of the mythos being this is fatalistic and right. and there's no hope? Like, how do you how do you establish that so that uh, it both scares the players but also encourages them to keep going and solve the mystery? The the, the topics uh, the the topic of cosmic horror is as you said it's it's inherently hopeless, right? It, it, the the grand scheme that they void. But we play games generally to seek out and d destroy a target. We want to be heroes in some capacity. So it, it depends on what system are we running, what are the, what's the framework we have to play in. If we're looking at, say, like a fifth edition game, you're superheroes. How do you challenge superheroes against something that may be an insurmountable challenge? It's consequence. Humans, people, are the worst villains because they make choices and they move forward and those choices play out. So even though the heroes may be rolling forward in, in pursuit of the special thingamajig that will help them seal away the entity, but what about the cultists that are over here? Why are they cultists and what are they doing? And a big part of the horror that can unfold from that is realizing that, I'm sure they have the cultist label. These are people. Why are these people doing this? Do I need to defeat the big tentacle thing or do I need to pull these people back into the world and remind them of where they were? Because that will save them, hopefully, right? And it gives you another target, a palpable target, something you can hit. Mm. But also it will weaken the power base of whatever you're going against. You present them with options and ultimately the characters and the players, but I want to challenge the characters. The characters make choices, they get invested and they have to play by the rules that they establish, the reality they help you build. One thing I think is very interesting, just to follow up on that, is that point of why is a particular thing scary? Mm -hmm. And like a big example to this of this for me is zombies. Okay. And on the one hand, a zombie is you know in D and D, a zombie is usually a bag of hit points. 
But the point is, a lot of times what is scary about zombies from a higher level concept is infection and loss, that these were people who have now become monsters, and that if they touch you, you might become a monster. And so part of that, I mentioned this in the, the last panel we were doing, is one of the things is if like I have a scene where you run into a mob of zombies or ghouls or whatever, I'll describe some of them. I'll say you're in a village, these are villagers, but then I'll say, oh, you know, you see an old butcher missing an arm, you see a child, then I'll say, each of you describe one of the zombies that catches your eye. And it comes back to what I was saying before. Part of it is let me know how grisly do they want to go, how, yep. you know, how brutal. Are they going to have a mother and child? Are they going to do something like that? Or are they like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, we don't want child zombies. That's mm -hmm. uh, very disturbing. But again, part of that is to also have the player stop and think. Yes. What I'm telling you is this isn't just a monster. It was a person. A super, um, to jump in, yep. a super effective thing you can do that's really easy at all of your tables, give a zombie a name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Make, yeah. The, make sure and, the characters know that name. And the, Watch it unfold. The last piece sort of tying to that, but also picking up on what Andrew said earlier, um, one of my favorite horror scenarios that I, I run re fairly regularly starts off as the players feeling like it's D&D &D, The Breakfast Club. Like they are a group of adventurers with very common you know, archetypes, the jock paladin, the, the cleric cheerleader. Um, and they're just going on what seems like a standard dungeon crawl and then they realize it takes a very short time and they come up and the zombie apocalypse is working out in town. Mm -hmm. And the point there is uh, for one shot, it's hard to get the... Horror is tricky in one shots because the players are not invested in the characters in the way they are in the long term. But one of the things I always do when I'm using pre-generated characters is not just handing them the character but asking them questions. So in this one, I say to the cheerleader, you had a fight with your kid sister before you, um, uh, bef you, know, before you left. What was it about? Uh, there's a cat cafe. Everybody has a favorite cat. Tell me about your favorite cat. When they come back, so then, well, they save the sister, but she's been bitten by a zombie and they can't save her. So you get that again. It's back to the, the horror is, what do you do when this person you love, you had that stupid fight with a sweater, you know, about, and you can't save her. That's the horror. Mm -hmm. And on the other hand, as soon as you find the first zombie cat, everybody is like, oh shit, did my cat make it? <laughs> you know, like you've given them something to care about beyond their hit points, beyond their status. Yes. So the uh, recurring theme that a lot of you are picking up on is that it, a really good tip is to make it personal mm -hmm. and to have the players um, invested in the descriptions and the narration. And that's, so that's one side of it on a meta level, right? On the other side of it is that even if the stakes are really huge, it should always, uh, there should always be a small stake, something, something to give them. So how does hope play into that? Anybody wanna, wanna take that ball for a little bit? What's the, the John Cleese movie, uh, Out of Time or something like that? And he says, it's not the despair that's killing me, it's the hope, something like that. Uh, 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 in, uh, in, the, in the bad old days of the, uh, the game industry, I used to say that a lot, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, without hope, I think you just kind of become a rampaging monster. So I, mm -hmm. I, I love dark settings. I love a setting of the bad guys have already won. Now what are you going to do? I do a lot of those. Uh, and I think it's about, okay, so, you know, what is the hope when all hope is lost? And I think, you know, probably a lot of us have been through something in our lives we can relate to a little bit in that. When that terrible thing happens, how do you pick yourself up and carry on? And uh, that can make for a pretty interesting game. We've done, Deadlands is kind of like that. You know, the bad guys are already there. A game we, we did called Evernight was based on uh, the trilogy of trilogies from the old 3.0 3 D&D. Where at the end of the adventures against uh, the mind flayers, they cast the world into darkness and you have to question the overmind to defeat it or whatever. Well, my players just went in and killed it. There was no way to save the world, right? So I said, okay, well, you just, you just cast the earth into a thousand years of, of darkness and slavery. And they were like, oh, man, can we play that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and that was their hope, right? That was cool. Anybody else want to talk about hope? I, th I think that hope looks different for different people. And for some people, especially like in slasher type of style of horror um, RPGs, uh, the hope is that you just survive. Um, especially if it's like a one shot or anything like that. Like you either, you're either the player that wants to be the last one standing 
or you are the player that wants to be like the one to go out in the most weird way. There, <laughs> and, and so, and, and like that would be that player's hope for that character. Like, so, so they might be trying to, as a character, find different ways to try and confront the killer for the player in hopes that their character dies, but the character is thinking, oh, I could just take them out. You know, like, I am this brave person. So, like, the, the hope of the player and the hope of the character are two different things, mm, and they play yes. out differently in the char- in, in, on the table, but the ending tends to be where the player's hope eventually falls. Okay, so let's, let's, let's talk about that from two different perspectives, because there's also the designing for the potential for choice, which is mm-hmm. what a lot of you have, have mentioned, but also managing that at the table, because a lot of times the, the games and the adventures that we design have a lot of possibilities, and mm-hmm. a lot of potentials, and, and the GM has to like figure out, okay, how do I accommodate those choices at the table without losing, losing the player's interest? So let's talk about <coughs> both designing for hope and managing hope, because I think those are two different things. So. Um, designing for hope. Uh, if you are running um, not a convention demo, but say that you are setting up a campaign, how, what are some things that you think about as a designer in your adventures to give players multiple possibilities in order to um, continue either fighting the monster or like how do you design towards hope to keep them vested? In, in Alien, Characters have secret agendas, okay, and their secret agendas is pretty much their hope, because one of someone, well, someone's secret agenda might be uh, your crew is your family, you die for them, okay. So your hope is, I'm going to make sure that they live even if I don't, you know. Um, if 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 you're if you're there to backstab them for the company, your hope is to make money and get out of your life, you know. So it, hope can be a, a very different things depending on the character in the scenario. So in that way, you translated hope into player motivation. Yeah. Okay. I would say one for me is um, with the game Phoenix Dawn Command that we made, one of the catches of Phoenix is that death not only isn't the end, it's how the character levels up. And, but they don't come back right away, and they don't come back where they died. So the point is we wanted this to be a game where Gandalf on the bridge of Moria is a valid solution to a problem. And part of it is it means both me and the players know I can throw a Balrog at them, that there are going to be situations that they cannot fairly face, and that if they try to fight, they will all die. But the question is, can someone bring down the bridge? Can someone find a solution? Mm. Um, okay. and, and the point is, you can have a total party kill and the game isn't over, but the mission will be lost. So it comes back to aliens. It's totally the, you can drop them in, they're tough, but they don't know what they're going against, and they, failure is on the table. Mm-hmm. And so first off, that changes things up because the players know, I'm not making this fair. You know, I, I, we can, the story will not be over if you all die, it will just go down a bad path. But part of that is because the game is driven by this desire for people to have heroic sacrifice, to want to hold the bridge, is that you need the players to feel like what they're doing matters. And the first step of that is very similar to what you were saying, is one of the basic points of character generation is saying, as a phoenix, you have come back to life to fight the darkness. Why? What are you fighting for? You know, why did you have the strength to do this? Because it's telling the players, this is a movie about this. If you would not lay down your life to try and protect something, Mm -hmm. you wouldn't be in this movie. And so first, it's exactly that. And it's a little different because you don't have the corporate backstabbers, you know, but it's saying, (laughs) you tell me what it is that is important enough to you to die for. Mm -hmm. And then the second part is as the adventure designer, saying we need something here that the people feel like, again, this matters. That, you know, go to aliens and it's theoretically we're saving colonists. Mm -hmm. You know, here it's, again, we have two hours to stop this zombie outbreak from happening. If we can contain it, even if we all die, we save this whole region. If we die, the story will go on, but we will have just lost Detroit. Mm -hmm. You know, and what's that going to do in the future? So one thing I want to point out about what Keith was saying was that... uh, to paraphrase, so character motivation is a way of bringing hope. 
the party's motivation or the objective of the scenario is not from everything that everybody has been saying, it's not about taking down the monster. Taking down the monster is uh, is a problem that gets in the path of solving the objective. Mm -hmm. But the objective for your scenes and your missions, uh, do you want to speak to that with the with the mythos as well? Would you would you agree with that? Yeah, yeah. I think when you have these these giant challenges, it's most effective to feature those challenges in a way that orbits around the, the the main goal that your characters are setting out to do whether it's you know get everyone to safety or find a thing or excavate this old ruin they happen to find something else and they have to either survive it or they have to deal with it but they still have a central goal and that gives them something to latch on to gives them something tangible that they can reach for and still have a measure of success while they're being well, while we're juggling all the other things, right? One of the things that um, you also all touched upon was how um, sometimes, like from shifting back to like DM tools for the same sort of thing, is that letting players know certain things up front is a very valuable tool to get them invested and to have them not be afraid of character death. Because I'm sure all every single one of you understand that. Like one of the one of the most frightening things for players is you know a lot of times when they have that anxiety that their character is going to die, they're worried about the game ending, and they're worried that they're going to crash the game or they're going to be excluded and not and not part of that. So so in your minds, how far would you, uh, if somebody wants to take up the ball and run with it, how far would you go explaining uh, a scenario or helping to set player expectations to get them vested? Would you flat out tell them that? You know, um, you're overpowered, uh, but don't worry about it. I got you. Like, like, how would you? How far would you take that? I, 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 I tell them you're gonna die. <laughs> it's a, it's like a movie. <laughs> okay, one person might get out of here alive or not. Um, so just expect to die, but know that there are other characters for you to pick up along the way. So you're not gonna be out of the game. Mm -hmm. So okay. just don't be too attached to your character. Just you, your goal is to play that character to the best of what that character is, and that's how you win. Not by surviving necessarily. The person who survives is amazing, <laughs> but that's another level. <laughs> um, because it's it's designed not to survive. It's it, that, that's not that, the point of the game, right? Yeah, that alien alien is is more to see what people do in those situations and 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 play that out and mm -hmm. and and achieve their goals along the way. You can achieve your goal and die, and then you still won because you achieved the goal. You know, so um, <clears throat> it, it's it's. Uh, People who have the most problem with Alien is Dungeons and Dragons players because they they love their character so much, and it's like you, this is not that. That's why I like running and, and writing the cinematic scenarios where people understand this is a separate movie that you're getting into, and you're going to play this person for tonight, and and we give you everything you need and, to and interpret it as you want. And people don't always interpret that character's agenda or whatever as the same way. They, they everybody has their own take on it, so you'll see vastly different things happening, and that's great. Um, but, yeah, I, I'll let them know they're not going to survive. I do think one interesting point on that setting things up from the first hand is this difference between we're in this room and a bomb suddenly goes off under the table, and at best that's a jump scare, and we're like, boom, didn't see that coming. But the other thing is if while you all walked in and were sitting down, you saw there was a bomb under the table, and then someone put a cloth over it, and you're just all waiting for it to go off while we don't even realize and so what I'm saying is that thing of saying potentially at the start, you know, like this mine is going to collapse or, you know, basically I'm, you're in the situation where people are going to die, mm. assuming a D&D &D scenario or something like that where that's not part of the thing. I can still say something like this mine is very unstable and put a D12, you know, large D12 on the counter and every now and then turn it down a number <laughs> and it's back to your crinkling paper. That's a good of, to yeah, some, yeah. To that's some degree... Sure. The players knowing, oh my goodness, the bomb just ticked, mm -hmm. you know, is more scary than not knowing there's a bomb in the first place until it goes off. Yeah, and, and partially what Keith is referring to, it's about it's about managing tension. Mm -hmm. And and managing tension I think can be can be very difficult. Uh, so so one of the ways that I, I manage tension is that I cut my scenes hard. Uh, and a lot of my scenes are very, very horror related. So I tend to think of scenes like for an hour. And then after that hour, I let people take a break and then come back to them and whatnot. 
Um, because without cutting the scenes hard, you know, sometimes it's like players are kind of floundering and they're not really sure where to go. But then that kind of gives them a contained time space in addition to a setting space. Uh, but I love the tip about the bomb and the dice kind of going down. Are there any other tips like that that you would recommend any of you? Um, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Um, uh, if you haven't played Dread, you probably should. Um, it uses the Jenga tower, and as, instead of rolling dice, as you do stuff, as your character does stuff, you pull a Jenga piece. And eventually that tower is going to collapse, and that's when your character dies. So it's really cool it is, is, yeah. is an extremely great mechanic that you can pull and use a Jenga tower in any of your games. Any sort of visual stress okay. mechanic works so well with that tension, and it organically builds that in. Um, the other one that I like to do is if I'm, I, I, I like playing around with sense, sensory things too. Um, and one of the tricks that I use um, that I learned from a, working a haunted house for many, many years um, is we had a dentist room. And I learned, <laughs> <laughs> we did, and like everyone, like there are so many people that are afraid of the dentist, right? And the dentist's office has a very particular smell. Mm -hmm. That smell is clove oil. If you want to stress your players out, just open some clove oil, essence of clove oil, in your gaming space. Mm -hmm. And just yep. set it there. Mm -hmm. You don't have to do anything other than that. And people are going to be like, oh my god, there were so many people who refused to go in the room just because it smelled like a dentist office. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Something I do, because I run a lot of 5th uh, edition with, with Horror Overlay, is at the beginning of my games, even in public spaces, I will look around the table and I'll tell them, we are going to be doing hard things today. You are going to make choices. If those choices result in your character dying, you will have a choice. Does the character stay dead or do I get to do a thing? <laughs> and that thing can be, you see the character go to zero hit points and a minute later, they just get up. And now the rest of the party's like, whoa, 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 what's Bob doing? I, I don't, I don't, mm. <laughs> <laughs> Or you can bring that character back up and have them, here, here's a little stat sheet. Now you are one of the undead cultists, and these are your foes. You can still continue to keep them as part of the play element. And by keeping everyone involved at the table, even when those things happen, everyone's imagination just, it flares, and they go nuts with it. In a good way. Looking even to a long-term campaign, mm -hmm. you know, and things like that, I mean, that's one of the things I definitely like to do. It's oh, part yeah. of the point, you know, we've already talked about the fact of, you know, hit points are not horrific. Losing hit points isn't scary. Mm -hmm. We've already talked about the fact that one thing is threaten things they care about. Give mm -hmm. them a cat. Give them a, a thing. Another thing is do things that they don't know the significance of. So fighting a rakshasa and, uh, you know, yeah, it can kill you or whatever, but at some point... You've beaten it very badly, you're about to beat it, and it grabs you and disappears, and your shadow is gone. Yep. And you just don't have a shadow, and then after your long rest, it's back. <laughs> and again, now we're at the, was that just what happened? Was it just a 12 hour or did it just move? You know, I mean, like, again, they don't know You're a dwarf, what it means. that's a, that's yeah. a, that's a help shot. Playing, what playing towards what people don't out. know is definitely an awesome trick. Mm -hmm. um, and I think to that, to that extent, there's a, there's a phrase that we all know, which is the red hair, right? Which is a very effective tool. Uh, Shane, how, um, do you ever use red herrings? Like how often do they come up in your campaign? Like what do you, what do you think of them as a tool? Uh, I probably do it more in campaigns than I do like one shots or you know convention adventures because uh, you know with a group of six people who don't know each other, I, I find you need to be a bit more direct. You know, let's mm -hmm. let's move through this thing and get on with it. But um, uh, I'm, I was playtesting a, a new Deadlands box set called Night of the Windigo recently, and um, this is gonna be a big spoiler alert. So if you don't want to hear this, uh, plug your ears. But. The, uh, you're in the city of Seattle. It's a city adventure for Deadlands, you know, for a cowboy game, which is a little bit odd to start with. But you run into a, uh, you know, a young vampire, and he's doing some bad things. You track him down to a house, and you think, okay, you know, maybe there's a couple more vampires. Maybe that's you know, the extent of it. And it turns out there is something so much worse there. So the red herring in this case just lured you into a death trap that mm -hmm. literally... 
you know, one of the guys I almost killed is sitting back there, but I, I killed <laughs> I killed a ton of PCs at this place, and it was a play test, right? So I want to see how lethal it, it is too, um, which is it, just what Andrew said about replacement characters. I, I tend to be a little more forgiving, or I'll find a way out to answer the last question. If the person is really invested in their character, I can tell it, or they've just picked an archetype and they're having a great time and playing it. But you know, that that person is probably going to die a little easier than the guy who's put all this effort into things. But red herrings, um, you know, maybe the best one that I ever read in fiction was Drakenfels, the old Warhammer novel. Uh, it's kind of like um, the end of Watchmen, right? You get to the castle and you find out, well, I already completed the scheme a year ago. You know, it's, it's yeah. done. But I, I lured you here because I wanted to kill you, kind of thing. So I don't do a lot of it because, you know, mysteries are hard enough already. People have, a, have lives and so forth. And remembering all the details of a big mystery week to week, it's pretty tough. So probably not so much. Okay, that's really good. Anybody else have opinions on red herrings to help balance the tension in a horror game? I, I feel, I, I like red herrings to a point, but you have to not overuse them. Because otherwise people are going to keep thinking, oh, is it a mimic? Is it a mimic? Is it a mimic? And, and then you like stall out on them exploring things because they're like, I don't want to touch that. That's going to bite me. <laughs> the boy who you tried know? mimic. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so you want to be careful with when you use red herrings and how you use them and to what effect you use them with. Mm -hmm. um, but otherwise, I, I do use them sometimes. I have other things that I enjoy playing around with mm -hmm. um, when it comes to, to that. And I also find that sometimes the red herrings can derail things to a certain point if you're not careful. I, I throw in, of course, there's the double you know, red herring, the Chekhov's red herring, if you will. And so one of the scenarios I talked about both earlier and the previous thing, uh, puts a bunch of things together. These uh, young adventurers go down into the dungeon, which they think is their main thing. They run into the ghost, which says, you can't defeat me, and then how long does it take them to realize they can't actually defeat this, they just need to not fight it and go by. Mm -hmm. So they deal with this crazy ghost, they leave it behind, because they don't have to fight it. Uh, you know, there's an earthquake, they go back up and discover that the zombie apocalypse has happened while they were down there. And then ultimately, what you get at the end is them discovering, oh, well, actually, because of what they did, they released the spirit from downstairs. That's why we're having the zombie apocalypse, and they have to actually fight that thing again. But this time, they can defeat it if they go through with it. Mm -hmm. And so part of it is that thing that was a red herring at the beginning and was kind of annoying, and we thought that was your big threat, and then it wasn't the threat at all. You're like, actually, it was, and you finally get a sort of satisfying, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. this time we do finally lay it to rest. And so that can be sort of fun to do that. Absolutely. First they think this is important, then they realize, shit, that was a red herring. Then they discovered that actually that kid vampire, you know, was like <laughs> a, a big thing, it can uh, be fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Callbacks are definitely fun too. Um, I, I think the thing with red herrings uh, that I was trying to get at is that in horror there's always seems to be some, some, some element of mystery to the game to give them something to do like in order for something to solve. Um, and the question is, um, how do you, because I know this is a thing that comes up a lot with DMs, how do you deal with players in a horror scenario and, and that there is this mystery that they have to solve where they want to know the answer right now, right this minute, they don't, you know, it's, it's scene one, they just want to keep guessing because they have so much anxiety before they proceed. Like, how do you handle those players? Like, what are some tips that you can give some DMs in the audience who is listening to all of your wonderful game design knowledge and thinking, well, how would I actually, how would I actually get my players from scene one to scene two? I, I think you actually nailed this. Having the physical reminder of some form of ticking clock can help stymie that, that, that person who wants to guess, 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 guess. Because if that clock keeps ticking down, the more this person guesses, well now you have one of your trope characters at the table and that, that character is, you know, they're, they're the brainy one, but they need to be ushered along by the, the rest of the, the Scooby gang, right? Uh, give them an, a bit of external stimuli to work against. That adversary is neutral, but is, is, is ever present the gm needs to have a good poker face also yes because when they're when they're when they're is it this is it this what who are you asking are you asking a character at the bar we're at or are you asking me you know like 
you want to ask someone in the room that you're in and go, let's, let's play that out. You know, don't, they, there's no reason we have to give them that information, you know, and let, let them decide what they want. And it's like um, an adventure that we, we actually had to pull this out because the, one of the adventures was too big. But I had set up this whole subplot about the serial killer was leaving, you know, remains behind that looked like it was an alien. And, and when we play tested it, everybody's ready for the alien. And no, it was, it was the, uh, uh, the census guy <laughs> that they had met earlier in the thing, you know? <laughs> so, you know, awesome. it's... Really, yeah. That's awesome. <laughs> um, I want to thank my panelists for, for listening to my questions, but now I would like to turn to the audience. Um, I will try to get to as many questions as possible. Um, please, uh, does anybody have any questions or do you want me to keep asking them? Uh, so. Yep, stand up and ask a question. All right, um, so there's a Hitchcock, Hitchcock quote I like that says, uh, you know, characters in the thriller don't call the police because it's boring. How would, how would you, do you have any advice for guiding players away from, you know, calling the authorities or running away from the scary scenario uh, or doing a sensible thing in a horror scenario? <laughs> Happens um, all the time, right? I, I, I'm sorry. Monica, do you have anything to say? I do. Because, um, so I'm the developer for Hunter the Visual 2nd Edition, and we actually account for that. Mm -hmm. uh, because in Hunter the Visual 2nd Edition, you are monster hunters who have to work, who are mortals who have to work within the confines of the world that you're in. And part of the setting is that, yes, the authorities may be called, and they become part of the antagonist for the story. Mm -hmm. So you are actually running from the cops. Uh, if you yep. go on an abandoned property, you have to get the frickin' permit to go on the abandoned property. Yep. Like these real world consequences are part of the choices yes. that are baked into the game. And I think it really does depend upon the game and the, and the game's conceit. And, yeah, I want to support that. I think a lot of times, especially in you know those heroic or the deep investigation games, characters find themselves on the wrong side of the law anyway, and calling the authorities is just gonna put more attention on them and take them away from whatever their mission is. I, I think there's a couple other sort of points that come in too of, again, it's all based on what the game is. Mm. Do the players actually think the authorities can handle this problem, or are you just calling some innocent people in who are gonna get killed? Yep. Uh, is there a time Now you're just feeding by the time, Yeah, you know, <laughs> is it a matter? So I'll say with, uh, with Phoenix. Where are the cops werewolves? I mean. You know, with Phoenix, yeah. one of the critical things we do with that is because, as I said, you need the players to feel like laying down your life on, you know, taking the bridge down is worth doing. Mm -hmm. One of the things is most of the adventures will have like a very clear time pressure. Like I said, you have two hours to stop this zombie, uh, this zombie plague and you know it. And so, yeah, it might be great to go back to the castle and get the thing, but there's no time. Mm -hmm. And so part of that is how you design the scenario. Is it this thing will get away? Is it this thing will infect people if you don't stop? Uh, but, you know, having the players have a reason that they feel like, I'd like to do the smart thing, but I can't. Mm -hmm. There's just no time. And you know, I, that's the kind of thing I'd look for. I think, you know, time and isolation, especially in something like Aliens, right, there are no authorities. They're easy, right. easy right. outs, and you can do that. Exactly. But, uh, I do what, what Keith just mentioned quite often. I've done it in ETU several times where the students, they will get definitive proof of something, right? They got a werewolf paw. They got this thing on film, whatever. They give it to the, the county police and the, the sheriff, and... And he says, okay, well, y'all go home, we'll take care of it. And then the next night you hear the entire police force has been killed. Yeah. Right? Uh, the the yeah. night of the Wendigo thing I was just telling you about, the, the, the terrible thing in the house. If you don't solve that issue, and, and you probably won't, they will trail you to the hotel. <laughs> They'll trail you to the hotel. They will chain the door shut, and then they set the hotel on fire. And that's to the player character. So imagine what they'll do to the sheriff that you went and asked or the town mm -hmm. cop, yeah. right? So, you know, yep. let them see there's consequences, horrific consequences. All right, I do want to get some more questions. I'm yeah. so sorry, but Andrew, you will take the next question. Stand oh, up, please. please. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say that you have a few players who are, like, nothing is off limits. They're willing to, for you to tell them anything. But there's one player who uh, might be a little bit more... Squeamish, I guess, doesn't necessarily has has clear limits. How would you deal with that? And is all the horror lost for like those other two players? Andrew, go. Does everybody want to play with that person? Yes. <laughs> then I guess you got to cater to that person. Yep. You know, yeah. You got to have a talk about it, 
and see what they're willing to deal with. Mm -hmm. um, yep. And how much horror it is depends on how much the group wants it. The group wants to play with that person. I think, I think sometimes too what happens with squeamish players is that the anxiety comes from sometimes not wanting to disappoint the other people at the mm -hmm. table because their threshold is so different from everybody else's. Mm -hmm. So my, my recommendation would be to find a comedy horror game <laughs> Uh, because when you find a comedy horror game and you can laugh at the mm -hmm. things that you're afraid of, you will be more likely to engage in something that is a little bit more scary, and then the 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 benchmarks will move. So like, kind of warm them up to the concept. Of warm them up to the concept. That that to me sounds like a social dynamic at the table that you have to manage by running different games first. Next question. I, I definitely want to get to. You please stand up. Thank you. Um, so when it comes to playing, DMing, or even like watching horror movies, when it comes to like the monster or the big scary thing, do you find it more suspenseful and terrifying to see it up front, or to put the little snippets in that you don't see it until the very end? You gotta hint at it. You gotta give it the fleeting shadow that crosses the moon. You've gotta give it the sound from behind the wall that they don't really know, but sounds kind of familiar and give it that slow build and eventually over time reveal more and more until there's no going back. They are in the chamber, whatever the chamber happens to be, the field, what have you, with this thing that they then get to identify. I, so in my case with the Chariot of the Gods, I was talking about dispelling expectations. I made, I made sure that people describe the pale skin on the thing that's in the shadows because Aliens are, you know, black color. So it's it, the minute you do that, people know, wait, that's not what I thought it was going to be. So you can use that to create more chaos even. Yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of what they mentioned earlier was to use sensory details because you have six senses, not just five. So uh, you can describe things like, you know, you feel a chill up the back of your arm and then you can increase those sensory details when the monster gets in closer proximity. Um, and that's a good way of pacing as well. And I'm just repeating a lot of what they said earlier. Would you like to stand up? Sure. So when you're, when you're writing a horror adventure. Right? Writing um, a horror adventure. Right, so uh, you have your words, you have an impression, so on. Once you hand that book out, whether you're publishing, playtesting, whatever, mm -hmm. how, do you, how do you carefully word things or how do you present things in the text? so that the GM then knows how to convey those things. I think sometimes you just be direct and you put a sidebar and say, hey, here's a very effective way to, you know, to shine a light on this thing. And to... I think you have to be kind of over the top when you GM horror. You know, I think you need to do voices and actions and give weird looks and all that kind of stuff. If you're kind of dry about that, I don't think horror is going to work so well. So I, I try to communicate that in writing as well. Playtesting is a great way to do it because, you're, as Keith said many times, the players will tell you what creeps yeah. them out about something, yep. and you can just put that right in there and make sure that it gets said. I will say in Phoenix, for example, with Phoenix Adventures, I set a lot of them where you know we say in specific points, ask the players for input on this. Mm -hmm. We then do include, and if your players aren't the kind of people who like doing that, here is a description you can use instead. Because not all players do right. want to, right. you know, to tell you. So basically encouraging the way I would run it, but then also saying, but here is a backup, you know, that you can do if you're not comfortable with that. A couple of snippets about how to turn it up and a couple of snippets about how to turn it down go a long way. A quick yeah, sidebar can solve a lot of problems. Yeah. And you know it's my adventure if there's bullet points. Because I, I, use, <laughs> I mean, I use lots of bullet points uh, because and I think mean, that points I like about bullets. Like and points about bullets. bullets. Yeah. 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 By the way, that's a great shirt. That is oh, an amazing t-shirt. Yeah. I, I absolutely love that shirt. Uh, it's never forget with a bunch of cassette tapes on. It's, it's like speak my language. Um, the Because uh, one of the things I think a lot of people forget, especially in modern horror, is that there are certain things about lighting and weather in particular that can really help set the mood. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, for example, um, if it's a Call of Cthulhu scenario and whatnot, um, I think it would happen to be very terrifying if it was a sunny day and there was no clouds in the sky and the and the sun all of a sudden went from bright yellow to a pale yellow with no explanation. You know, I mean, there's mm -hmm. there's these really beautiful 
things in our natural environment that you can use. Um, and sometimes we just take them for granted unless it's a fantasy setting because you know, we expect that everybody knows these things, but world building in, mo in, in modern era, it's still world building in a modern era. Um, and with Westerns too, there's so much stuff like uh, some of the visceral details about Westerns that, that Shane has done. Um, yeah, there's just a ton of stuff. So don't overlook the small things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And be a ham. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Lean into it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Do we have any more questions? Does anybody have any more questions? Please stand up. Thank you. Mechanics. Mechanics. You talked a little bit about the, the Jenga Tower and, mm -hmm. and so on. I think Sandy and Call of Cthulhu. Are there game mechanics that you've either come up with or encountered that you think are really helpful for building the horror in a game? Game mechanics for building a horror. Do you have any recommendations? I mean, from... I, I didn't create it, but I love the stress mechanic that the alien yep. has. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's one of the yeah, best stress, really mechanics. stress anyway. mechanics. Stress is really good. Similar systems to that. Um, ten I, candles. Yes, ten, ten candles. candles is excellent, Dread. Yeah. Um, please, please do away with sanity and madness. Yes. Like, I'm with you. Just, <laughs> just chuck it out the window and use a corruption system. Yeah. Use something that shows a degradation rather than a straight assignment yeah. of crippling disability. So I will give you one that's a little unusual. Um, um, so when, you're, when your players are stressed out, have uh, one of them roll against the other to uh, one console the other character. Mm -hmm. um, having PvP First mechanics, um, either with uh, using, uh, you know, in D&D, I ran a scenario where you know, they were kind of freaking out because uh, there was a curse and uh, nobody could die, but you know, some of the clerics was like, oh my god, nobody could die, and all of a sudden they were undead, so they had to rock, roll a wisdom save because that was the closest mechanic to, you know, sanity or mind or, you know, how do I keep it together? But PvP mechanics, I think, are very powerful because what it does is it grounds the players in the horror um, and it gives them something to do. So consoling one another, helping one another in that way um, on an emotional level is is also I think as powerful as healing or even healing spells because it's an emotional thing mm -hmm. and it helps keep them vested in what they're doing. That so reminds like, me of Tales from the Loop where yes. both a lot of the injury sort of things aren't actually physical, they are more about state of mind and yeah. then basically talking with the other players is sort of how you heal them. Um, I'll throw out just another example of like a mechanical thing you can play around with. Uh, something I did for Phoenix was you know, someone gets a spell, and the spell is a powerful spell that will tell you, essentially, weaknesses of an enemy. But every time you cast it, it will also tell you a terrible secret about one of your friends. Uh, and you have to pick the person, and they have to tell you a secret that is not only a terrible secret, but it's worse than the last thing we've learned from this. And the point is, they don't have to do it. They can just say, no, I don't have anything worse than that. And the spell fails, and it never works again. And so sort of this is a tool you have as a party that you can keep using as long as we keep learning something worse. And it is a combination of, again, letting the players decide how bad it gets and also letting the players decide, I'm opting out of this. I can't um, unlearn this. Yeah, and, yeah, but that's the thing is when it works, it also is because it's a secret is encouraging the player. Tell me something I don't know about your character. What is a terrible thing? Like mm -hmm. they wouldn't, and it then suddenly generates a whole new piece of story that we can all play with because yes. of the terrible thing that we found out about Crystal, you know. <laughs> and uh, if they want to go there, but it's that whole point of let the players decide how deep they want to get into mm -hmm. this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have? have... Okay, so um, so before we uh, have time. If, we, if you can tell people, uh, Andrew, we'll start with you, tell people where to find you, and then give like one last sage bit of wisdom or advice to close this out. Uh, yes, sage. Don't start with me on that. Sage bit of wisdom or advice. Want to come back? Do you, do you want to come back? Do you want yeah. me to start on yeah, this side? Yeah, start over there. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start on this side, and then I'll, uh, I'll yeah. close this out. So, go so ahead. again, I'm Alan Patrick. Uh, I can be found uh, generally on Twitter, I guess. Uh, other places for sure. Uh, anyway, fake Twitter. fake Twitter, yes, whatever it is. Uh, recently finished a book with Alex Cammer. It's all over Kickstarter right now. Uh, we funded in a couple hours, so we'll be talking a lot about that. One of the biggest tips I can give you going forward, notes in 
old, old thing. Just hand a note across the table to your players. The note can be as simple as, there's nothing on this note. React as if there is. Mm. And it's especially helpful when one of your players isn't really into horror stuff, but everyone else is. Because you can be PG in your verbs, you know, in how you're, in how you're verbalizing everything, and a little more explicit in the writing, and everyone is taking care. And I just love you can give them a note just saying, hey, everything's okay. You're doing great. So Don't good. worry. <laughs> 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 no. um, but you gotta have the quotes on that. Of course. Of course. <laughs> uh, I'm Keith Baker. Uh, you can find me again at keithbaker.com, uh, Patreon, uh, Hell Cow Keith on almost all the socials, and togetherstudios.com. That is T W O GETHER. Um, again, to me, the biggest thing is all about knowing your players, and the easiest way to know your players is to ask them questions. Yeah. Uh, especially, this is, I'll just throw again for one shots. With one shots, giving people pre generated characters, I will always give them questions to answer about the character so that they end up feeling it's their character, not mm -hmm. just this thing that has just been handed to them. Yes. 100%. I'm Crystal Mazur. Um, you can find me on all social media at Body and Soul 152. My website is thegeekypanda.com, where you'll see a list of all of the books and stuff that I have written on. Um, and you can also find me at Darker Days Radio Podcast, which is where the recording is going to be again. Um, and the one thing that I would actually suggest, which is the, to manage the guessing thing too, is a little teacher trick that I have where at the end of every single session, you ask everybody to make a prediction, write it down, and then don't look at it until the end of the game, where you go through as a group and see who actually guessed everything along the way and who didn't. That's a nice trick. That's, That's a nice cool, trick. I like that. Uh, Shane Hensley, Savage Worlds Deadlands, you Google them, you'll find me. Um, I like contrast in horror games. I think a lot of GMs, when I've had this panel, you know, for hundreds of years now, uh, is, you know, how do I make my session so scary? And the truth is, you can't make it scary for four straight hours. So I think contrast is a big deal. Mm -hmm. Kate Evans was talking about at Monty Cook Games, which I played one of their lovely games yesterday, that it starts as a 007 adventure and ends as a Muppet show, right? <laughs> and that's okay for a while, because you can build back to it. But the contrast can apply to everything through the game. Like, I'll have... You know, something in a haunted house scratching against the wall and I make that light sound and my players are listening and they're like, oh, the hell, what, what the hell is that? And then, boom, something comes out and everybody at the table jumps, right? So that contrast, I think, is a big important part of, of horror. That's what jump scares are, right? It goes from the scary to the loud, or the, the tense to the loud. I'm Andrew E.C. Gasca. You can look for me on Facebook uh, under Andrew E. Gasca. It's my personal account. Feel free to ask questions. I'll always get back to you. If I'm on deadline, it may take a day or two. I will respond. Um, uh, when it comes to narrative description, you don't want to have you don't you don't want to have your players sitting there while you read a novel to them. So use it sparingly, but if you use it right, you can use it to really freak them out about a gruesome thing by not telling them what it is while you're telling them what it is. And I know that makes no sense. I would hope to talk about it more here, but you can always reach out to me on Facebook, and I'll explain that. <laughs> And then my name is Monica Valencinelli. I'm your friendly neighborhood uh, moderator, and uh, I've been in gaming longer than I care to admit. Um, Books of Them is where you can find me, and my tip is um, if the players need a what I like to call a security blanket, they need something to make themselves feel comfortable, a dog, um, a, a plushie that they bring around, around with them in-game, etc., just let them do that, don't threaten it. Give them the sense of safety and security so that they feel comfortable and feel vested and I guarantee you they will open up and trust you more as a, mm -hmm. as a DM. And that is time. Uh, first of all, I would, love to, I, I would like to thank my very full panel of esteemed <laughs> and established guests talking about a very important topic.